One of the most fundamental problems we deal with day to day is determining the shortest, most optimized path to achieve a particular goal. Think about it. You wake up to go to work one morning and there's a traffic jam on the route that you typically take. So you've got to figure out a different route so that you can get to work on time. Or maybe you're looking to quickly check out at a grocery store, so you determine which checkout line would be the quickest. You'd assess which line has the fewest people, but maybe you'd also check how many items each person has to check out. Or maybe your goal is not temporal, but something else. Imagine you're in an electric vehicle at some starting location. This will be called our source node. We've also got some destination on the map that we're trying to reach. In between, we've got other nodes we can pass through to get to our destination. Connecting these nodes together are some roads we can drive our car on. These are called edges, and each of these edges has a weight associated with it. These weights represent the amount of battery consumed by your electric car after traveling that edge. So if we start with 100 battery at our source node and travel this edge, now we're down to 65 battery. Our goal here is to reach our destination with the most amount of charge left on our battery. All right, so I want to clean this graph up a bit so that it's a little neater for the video. Okay, so now that this is all cleaned up, you'll see that we still have our source and destination nodes here. A is our source node and F is our destination node. You may notice that I've also opted to use a directed acyclic graph or a DAG for this example. This means once our car leaves a node, it's impossible for it to find its way back to that node. I've done this for a reason that I'll get to later in the video. Okay, now that we've got our problem laid out here, we need to determine a method in which to solve it. Now, just by looking at this graph, you all can probably solve for the best route pretty quickly by yourselves. But not all problems are this simple. We need a systematic way to find the best solution. In 1956, Edsger Dijkstra, sitting in a cafe in Amsterdam, devised an algorithm in just 20 minutes that could do just that. This algorithm is known as Dijkstra's algorithm, and it became the cornerstone of his fame as a computer scientist. But Dijkstra left behind many other hidden gems, like his method to find prime numbers, which I covered in my last video that you should definitely check out. Alright, so what is Dijkstra's algorithm, and how can we use it to solve this problem? So, the first thing we want to do is keep up with the amount of battery it takes to get to each of these nodes. Since we haven't visited any of these nodes yet, we'll assign each of them with infinity. Now, we want to start at our source node, A, first, and since it's our starting point, we can assign it with zero. Next, we want to take a look at all of A's neighbors to see if we can relax them. Now, what do I mean by relaxing? Well, as you can see, for example, the C node currently takes an infinite amount of battery to get to it. But if we look, getting to A takes zero battery, and getting from A to C takes 35 battery, so a total of 35 battery to get to C, which is less than infinity. So we can relax C with this new value. And we can do the same thing for nodes B and D. Now, since we've relaxed these nodes, we want to add them to a min heap priority queue so that they are sorted by the smallest amount of battery first. We also want to keep track of each of these nodes' predecessors. So since A was able to relax B, C, and D, we will assign A as each of their predecessors. Now that we are done with A, we will no longer be visiting A for the remainder of this process. This is an important feature of this algorithm. Because of this, the algorithm is very efficient because it ensures that we only visit each node only once. However, this does cause a drawback in the algorithm that we'll see in a moment. The next step is to pop the top element of our min heap priority queue. So B is next, and we start the process all over again. So we look at all the neighbors and relax them if we can. We'll add E to our queue, and you'll see that D has been relaxed down to 25, so it gets bumped to the top of the queue. We also want to update D's predecessor to B, and we'll add E's predecessor as well. Next, we pop D from our queue, visit its neighbors, and relax them. We add F to the queue and add its predecessor as D. Next is E, and we look at its neighbors, and you'll notice here that no relaxation can be made because D and F have smaller values already associated with them, so we can move on. Next is C. So we visit its neighbors, and again, no relaxation can be made, so we move on. And last is F, which has no neighbors at all, so we can stop there. 
And so there we have it. We can trace the shortest path by first starting with our destination node, F, finding its predecessor, which is D, and then D's predecessor, which is B, and then B's predecessor, which is A. So using Dijkstra's algorithm, we found our most optimal route for our electric vehicle to get from node A to F with the most amount of charge left on the battery. But now let me throw a curveball. Imagine between nodes C and E, the city decided to build an electric car charger. Because of this, let's say now this weight, or cost for traveling from C to E, becomes negative, meaning we actually gain battery here. If we use Dijkstra's algorithm again, we run into an issue. Everything is the same during the first part of the algorithm. So when we get to E, you'll see that it still can't relax F because 45 is less than 55. But if we move on to visit the C node, you'll see that it can relax E to 5 because of the negative weighted edge. And after this, E would be able to relax F to 30. However, since we already visited E, remember Dijkstra's algorithm will not revisit it and therefore cannot relax F. So E will not get added back to the queue, but will update E's predecessor to C and move on. Next is F and it has no neighbor, so we end it there. So using Dijkstra's algorithm in this case still gives us the old route where starting at 100 battery, we end up at our destination with 55 battery. But you'll notice that if we go to C first, then pass over this negative weighted edge to E so that we can charge our electric vehicle, and then go to F from here, we actually end up with more battery going this way. By introducing a negative weighted edge, we cause Dijkstra's algorithm to produce an incorrect solution. This is understandable given that Dijkstra originally designed the algorithm to find the shortest path between two nodes in a graph where edges are always positive, like using distance or time. The algorithm was never intended to handle problems with negative weighted edges. Now, you may discover Dijkstra's algorithm will occasionally yield a correct solution in such cases, but it would be purely by chance. Therefore, it should never be used when negative edges are present. Okay, so we can't use Dijkstra's algorithm for this problem, so we need another solution that can handle the negative weighted edges. In 1958, mathematicians Richard Bellman and Lester Ford Jr. published the Bellman-Ford algorithm that is capable of doing just that. This algorithm continuously performs sweeps across the graph trying to relax each node until no further relaxation steps can be made. So first, just like Dijkstra's algorithm, we're going to assign infinity to each node and we'll set our source node to zero. Now we can perform a sweep across the graph. We don't necessarily need to start at the source node, so I'll just pick from D to F first. D cannot relax F because infinity plus 20 is still infinity. A can relax D since zero plus 40 is less than infinity. Since we relax D, let's set its current predecessor to A. Next, B cannot relax D. E cannot relax D, B cannot relax E, A can relax B to 5, and now B's predecessor is A, E cannot relax F, C cannot relax F, C cannot relax E, and A can relax C to 35, and we set C's predecessor to A. Okay, now I want to keep track of how many sweeps we've completed, so we've just done one complete sweep. Next, we need to ask ourselves, did we relax any nodes, or did we update any nodes? We did relax B, C, and D, so yes, we did. And because we've answered yes here, we continue on with another sweep. Now, I'll just let this play out. All we're doing here is going back over all of the nodes in the same order to see if they could be relaxed, and if they can, we'll update their predecessors. Once we're done with that, that's our second sweep, and yes, we did relax some nodes, so we continue on with a third sweep. After the third sweep, again, yes, we did relax some nodes, so we perform a fourth sweep. At this point, after our fourth sweep, we did not relax any nodes, so we can stop here. And so there we have it. And so again, to find our optimal path, we can start at the destination node F, find its predecessor E, then find E's predecessor C, and finally C's predecessor A. And now we have the correct solution. However, as you've probably gathered, this is a much slower method than Dijkstra's because for each of these sweeps, we had to visit all of the edges of our graph until a solution was found. 
Also, why was I keeping count of the number of sweeps that were performed during each step of the algorithm? Does that even matter? The reason for this is because it can be used to act as a stop check for the algorithm in case it's dealing with a graph that contains a negative cycle. Remember I said I used a directed acyclic graph for this video. This was the reason for that. This graph contains no cycles in it, so therefore it can't have a negative weight cycle. Here's a simple example of a graph with a negative weight cycle. As you can see, with each sweep, using the Bellman-Ford algorithm, it will always check yes to having updated a node. Because this negative cycle produces smaller and smaller values during each sweep, so this will just keep going on forever. So we keep up with how many sweeps we've done so that we can stop after a certain number of sweeps. Well, how many sweeps should we stop after? Well, if you think about it, the longest possible solution for a graph with no cycles, the path would visit each node in the graph just once. And in the worst possible case, let's say the Bellman-Ford algorithm in an attempt to solve this graph only relaxes one node per sweep. In other words, we sweep n minus one times where n is the number of nodes in the graph. It's n minus one because we don't need to count the starting node. So in the Bellman-Ford algorithm, if the number of sweeps surpasses the number of nodes in the graph minus one, that means there is some negative cycle within the graph causing infinite relaxations to nodes. So at this point, we can break out of the algorithm and call it not solvable due to a negative weight cycle being present in the graph. Now, providing a reasonable shortest path solution for a graph that contains a negative weight cycle reachable by the source is an NP-hard problem and an ongoing area of research in computer science. I'm sure one of you watching this will one day be the person to discover a brilliant solution to this. But until then, if you want to improve your knowledge in computer science or some other field, your next step should be to visit today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. If you're like me, you learn best through a hands-on experience, and Brilliant has mastered this interactive approach. They offer thousands of gamified lessons that make learning the fundamentals of math, data science, programming, and even artificial intelligence engaging and fun. What distinguishes Brilliant is its proven effectiveness. By engaging directly with real-world problems, you're not only absorbing information, you're actively applying it which significantly enhances your retention of the information. Another great feature is the flexibility to learn on the go. With the Brilliant app, you can pick up right where you left off, turning idle time into productive learning sessions instead of aimlessly scrolling through social media. Brilliant provides courses that give you insights into programming logic using loops, variables, and conditionals, and even offer a dedicated course to help you get started in Python, where you'll be able to create your own programs on day one. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org B001 or click the link in the description. You'll also receive 20% off an annual premium subscription. I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring today's video and thank you for watching.